Super Castlevania 4 playthrough. I'm attempting to blow your mind with a cheat that probably everyone knows by now. Yep, if you ever get this far and you feel like you have no hope, just hop on down here into Oblivion and power up. Okay, all done. Just be careful not to fall off the short invisible ledge here. Okay, just up these stairs and I'll be in Dracula's throne room, or bedroom, or studio apartment, or whatever it is you're shacking up in these days. Ho, oh, Dracky poo Are you home? Huh, a lot of space. Not a lot of furniture, but I suppose all he really needs is a coffin and an open concept room. Alright, this is Dracula, the final boss of the game, and this is the final battle of the game. Now in past Castlevania games, Dracula was a lot more difficult, since almost everything he threw at you was pretty hard to dodge, and the fact that he later turned into much harder versions of himself during the battle, except in Castlevania 2. In this game, however, Dracula's kind of a pushover, and he also doesn't have a crazier, larger second version of himself. Yeah, sure, he has a bunch of cheap, annoying moments, and yes, you can definitely die if you weren't trying very hard, but overall, as long as you're trying just a little, like I am here, then you can definitely beat him. Of course, I did cheat in the beginning, and that helps a lot, but you don't really need all this firepower. I just did that so I could hurry this part along, and I could beat him that much quicker. So first he throws glowing fireballs, then he starts creating flaming Ghost Rider skulls. I wonder how Marl feels about this. Well, I'll tell you how I feel about this. Dracula's a terrible host. I mean, look, I come all this way through swamps and stairs to visit him, and I just want to, you know, take his life. And all he wants to do is kill me? Jeez, what a jerk. Instead, he sticks his pet flame skulls on me while he plays hide-and-go-seek. So this is the extent of Dracula's power, I suppose. I guess I was expecting more than just, you know, starting fires and teleportation. I guess maybe he turns into a bat and feeds on the blood of humans on his off time? Okay, I get it. You can make fire happen and stuff. Man, this is getting old. Oh, hey, check it out. He's been holding out on me. With some glowing ball meat. Okay, maybe he is a good host after all. Since, you know, he's feeding me and making sure I don't die. <laughs> yeah, this all makes sense. Well, maybe he'll turn into a giant bat monster and try to stomp on me. Nope, sorry. The game designers just couldn't do it, I think. He's just doing the same teleporty stuff, and now he's trying to electrocute me? So I'll just keep tossing boomerangs around, I guess, and see if I can, you know, see if I can kill him and stuff. So as you can see, he's pretty simple. This whole battle is pretty straightforward. Dodge, throw boomerangs, repeat, and win. Okay, he's dead. Now cue the sunlight and watch him explode into a bunch of bats. Man, I feel like a bunch of bats just screamed out in terror and were suddenly silenced. So this is how it ends. Dracula the bat falls to my feet. Die, die, yeah. And all you have to do is squat down for a few seconds over his dead bat carcass and the mess is gone. I'm just going to do my final pose here and finished. Okay, Dracula's defeated. Evil has been vanquished. Now how the hell do I get out of here? Well, we do have end music playing, which means we have a cutscene. Looks like the beginning to a Disney film here. <laughs> So Simon Belmont is probably reflecting on how he did all of this wearing nothing but leather and no pants. And apparently a demolition team was called in to raise the castle to the ground. Okay, as the credits roll, I figured I'd talk about some Super Castlevania IV game facts I scoured the internets for that I think you might find interesting. So here goes. There were several releases for the Castlevania series that predated this game. The first being Castlevania, originally released in 1986 for the NES, then Castlevania II Simon's Quest in 1987 for the NES, Haunted Castle, an arcade version released in 1988, Castlevania The Adventure for Game Boy, and Castlevania III Dracula's Curse for the NES in 1989, Kid Dracula in 1990 for the Famicom, and Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge in 1991 on the Game Boy. Super Castlevania IV was the first Castlevania game to appear on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991, and since then there have been more than 25 titles that have been released for this series up through 2014. Super Castlevania IV by itself has had its share of re-releases. In 2006 it was released on the Wii Virtual Console, in 2013 for the Wii U Virtual Console, in 2016 for the new Nintendo 3DS, and is also included as one of the 21 games on the Super Nintendo Classic Edition, which was released in 2017. 
Yes, people certainly love this game, and it is indeed one of the classics that received critical acclaim and has been considered one of the greatest video games of all time. Now, Super Castlevania IV was not an original game. It was meant to be more of a retelling and expanded version of the original Castlevania game, as it takes place in the same year, 1691. Some of you out there may not know this, but there were only two official Castlevania releases for the SNES, the other being the not so well-known title, Castlevania Dracula X, which was a mediocre port of the PC release titled Rondo of Blood. The Japanese version of the game titled Akumajo Dracula, roughly translated to Demon Castle Dracula. It included Blood in Level 8 that was changed from red to green, as I mentioned during part eight of the playthrough, other differences include religious symbology such as crosses on tombstones and caskets and a depiction of Jesus Christ on the password screen. The statues in stage 6 were originally topless and even the title screen of the game looked different and featured dripping blood. All of these items were removed or altered in international releases of this game due to censorship and to avoid controversy. Speaking of things being altered, it's interesting to note that the prologue screen was altered in order to maintain that the game takes place after Castlevania II Simon's Quest. Another interesting fact is that Konami didn't allow the real names of the designers and programmers that worked on this game to be used. Instead, they were renamed. For instance, if you saw the name Yaipan here in the credits, that was actually the code name for Mitsuru Yaida, the man responsible for programming the game's protagonist Simon Belmont and implemented the whip system. On the subject of the whip Simon uses, I mentioned in episode 11 that it's called the Vampire Killer, and that its name has been used throughout the series for various things. For instance, the track name of the first stage in the original Castlevania is called Vampire Killer, which has been remixed several times throughout the series. It is also the name of the Japanese release of the first game in the series for the MSX2 computer platform. Super Castlevania IV gained a lot of respect for its ability to produce some of the best sounds and audio heard on the SNES considering it was one of the first games released for the system. The soundtrack is famous for its dark foreboding atmospheric music as well as upbeat catchy tunes the Castlevania series is known for. The game also presents music of the Baroque and Rococo eras and are found throughout the soundtrack, as well as jazz ensembles, which are incredibly complex and were way ahead of their time considering it was a first gen game. Just like the remixes of old tunes found in this game, many of the songs from this game were remixed later in Castlevania titles, such as Chronicles on the PlayStation, Bloodlines on the Sega Genesis, Circle of the Moon on the Game Boy Advance, Legacy of Darkness on N64, Lament of Innocence on PS2, and Harmony of Despair on Xbox 360 and PS3. This is a staple of the Castlevania series to remix old songs. However, that was broken when Lords of Shadow was released. On a personal note, I think everyone should play this game at least once in their life. This is one of my favorite Castlevania games next to Symphony of the Night, and I've been playing this game since I was a teenager. It's always been the most memorable and the easiest in the series in my opinion, and is also one of those games I could sit down and play through on a whim, anytime. And just in case you were wondering, I'm not actually filled with all this knowledge. I got a lot of this information from various sites such as CastlevaniaWiki.com, Wikipedia, and BGFacts.com. So if you want to read more about this game and others in the series, feel free to visit those sites. Now I just want to say a few thank yous to those that have been a part of getting Geek Feature off the ground. First, I would like to thank my wife, Jenny Perry, for all of her love and support of me and my geekdom. Dave Hurley for always being the supportive force and pushing me to launch this channel. Andrew Liang and Brian Aguirre for the audio equipment and audio support. Topher Salinas for the great riff ideas. Patrick Gamaliel for always being the one to actually watch these and comment. And finally, to the rest of you out there, thanks for watching. Feel free to like or subscribe if you haven't already. And also, if you have any ideas for games you want to see me play in the future, feel free to put it in the comments. That's it for this series of videos. I'll be doing more playthroughs in the future because I have a lot of games I want to work on, so stay tuned. Also, I want to post other types of content on this channel as well. I just need to figure out what that is. I just do this on the side for fun, so I'll get to it when I can. But anyway, I'll see you on the next one. This has been another Geek Feature.